what should I say, ladies and gentlemen, or hi folk. Let's begin. The people are still eating and discussing things, but um, <coughs> we shall not be vulnerable to their uh, noise pollution. I'm sorry, but the word vulnerable is going to be with us now. So uh, first of all, I'm not going to give you some sort of long introduction sharing my personal thought about vulnerabilities. The floor is going to be to the people left and right of me. I'm also not going to spend a lot of time on introducing them. It is a lot of noise. Um, is there any way that the break can be finalized here, people of the organization? <laughs> oh, Julie Cohen, you are fantastic. <laughs> Now, out of politeness, I will wait till she is back. Um, but in the meantime, I can tell you that I'm not going to spend all the time introducing all the members of this panel because they are so facing. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is going to be the fun panel. <laughs> Good. So all the people behind the table, except for me, are so famous. If you want to know their background, as soon as you get bored, Google them and you will know everything about them. Um, and the person who is calling the shots in the other part is Julie Cohen. Uh, if you don't know her, then, well, what to say. So we are going to discuss um, vulnerability in relation to data protection, AI, and everything. Thank you. Yes. You have done some very great things, but now we see the power, you know, this is about power. Um, so we are going to be discussing vulnerability in relation to data protection, data processing, artificial intelligence. <coughs> That's a PR term, but all sorts of complex data processing uh, procedures. And I first question I'm going to ask each person is, and I'm going to ask it only once because now they all know which question that is, what are the key vulnerabilities here that are at stake? Is this about children, elderly people, um, low income people, immigrants, unemployed, the sort of usual suspects? So is this about technologies that potentially reinforce or consolidate existing uh, vulnerabilities? Or is this maybe also about a new type of vulnerability that is, for instance, created by uh, the behavioral data that are collected all over the place? And one type of behavioral data is, of course, our language behaviors. And I'm thinking now of the famous GTP because GTP feeds on behavioral data, our language behavior. Um, I first want to ask this question to Malavika Rakva, and I'm going to give the floor to you now. Uh, thank you very much, and I have about three and a half minutes to respond to that question, I think. Uh, but also, I'm going to keep it very short. Obviously, I think it's a very difficult question to answer, and I'm going to be drawing on uh, some of the work of all of my panelists, especially Gian Claudio's recent work on vulnerability, but also Mireille's. And I think at the highest level, how I would frame this idea of vulnerability is really to think about it as an idea of susceptibility to harm, right? And again here, this is a definition which some regulators, like the UK's FCA, for instance, is using when it's thinking about consumer vulnerability. And when you think about susceptibility to harm, really I think there are two dimensions across which we have come to understand this kind of vulnerability. One is the idea of kind of agent-specific or person-specific harm, which could be seen as class-based vulnerability. Some of the things we discussed, such as being from a low-income group, your race, your gender, your age, disability status, these kind of, kind of ascribed status, or you know, which happens either by birth, but also when you're born into a particular structure. And I think the other one is kind of more new and interesting for us when we think about the vulnerability that is driven by the interaction of factors in your environment. So these are vulnerabilities that 
may not be pre-existing, but may be amplified or may come, come to existence and subside. Right? And we think of this as more environment-based vulnerability. And here I'm thinking of uh, vulnerability from, say, job loss or sort of sudden illness, where even someone who may not have a pre-existing vulnerability may be in a su sudden vulnerable situation. Now, why are we talking about this at CPDP? I think that's kind of my aim to convince you that it is important in the next minute or so, is that obviously this has always existed in society, but I think in the kind of datafied landscapes in which we are operating, there is a particular kind of amplification of some of these effects, and that's just because of the homogenization of digital data and how quickly that can then be shared, and so on and so forth. But I think there's also another category of kind of unique effects because of the nature of digital technology and datafication. And I think that's what the people in this room are also interested in, right? And here I'm thinking about things that we're aware of now, filter bubbles, denial of service attacks, perhaps, or, you know, software obsolescence, which are things that can be fundamentally, you know, obstruct your access to services and enhance your pre-existing vulnerabilities or environment-based vulnerabilities. And just to kind of bring that home a bit, I thought I'd bring an example from something that I'm currently looking at in my uh, research, which is really the idea of digitalized welfare systems, right? Often these are kind of mediated by digital ID technologies. The idea is to collect data about you so that we can know who you are, so we can target our welfare. And I think, obviously, I think there, there's a couple of things here that maybe one example will draw out. On, across both dimensions. Now, welfare surveillance, for instance, is kind of a big topic of discussion, I understand, in the Netherlands, uh, recently with the Siri case, but lots of other, like definitely in India, where we had a Supreme Court case uh, about this. And the question really comes down to, can you, how much should you target someone with a pre-existing vulnerability? But I think the other big question, which maybe I'll kind of hand back over to my panelists to discuss, is what do these datafied contexts then do to people with pre-existing vulnerabilities, right? So what happens when someone who is perhaps a low-income manual, you know, laborer, dependent on welfare, coming into a system, what happens if a particular biometric technology choice means that there's an authentication failure because of the way that the algorithm, matching algorithm works? What happens if their fingers are worn off due to the same manual labor for which they are choosing welfare? What happens in a datafied context when that original fingerprint data is no longer valid? And these are kinds of, I think, specific datafied harms, I would say. Uh, and on that note, I'll kind of hand over to re-problematize. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, now, do you, for instance, envisage participative models? And do you think that could mitigate, could there be a role for participative uh, engagement to mitigate this kind of vulnerability? Um, again, obviously, that's a very deep question uh, with a lot of regulatory thinking. I think I come to you not as a cynic, but as a skeptic today, uh, especially from my context, my research context, and where a lot of my life has been is India. And I think this word of participatory design, for instance, can sometimes be co-opted. How is it possible for someone facing a data fight system to really participate in holding that system accountable? I think it's often, it, it's a difficult question. If you do not know that you are a member of a group inside a database, this idea that you can then be given collective data rights, uh, it, it, it is very hard, I think, to operationalize. So sure, there is a question of participation, but I think that needs to be very carefully um, targeted and kind of created so that we don't basically co-opt that word to justify what's going on. What sort of transparency would that require? Hmm. <laughs> this, is, this is good. It's like being back in law school, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, well, I think, actually, there, so there's an interesting, we were just talking, uh, I think I was meeting, I think, Daphne from the Canadian uh, Office of the Commissioner of Privacy, who's in the audience, maybe. Um, and this whole idea of, you know, transparency by design and privacy by design that we kind of bandy around so easily these days. I think the question really is transparent. If we say vulnerable to whom, it is transparent to whom, right? So if I'm going to a welfare beneficiary and saying, I'm going to collect these 100 types of your data to give you your benefit, the idea that they're going to press for transparency there is in that power structure is, I think, completely, you know, fanciful. If, however, I was having a conversation with a developer who is 
perhaps running the system, setting the match rate on the algorithm for, you know, what is the appropriate match of a biometric uh, fingerprint? Is it 82% to the original scan? Is it 60%? That is the kind of transparency that I think, if they could have a conversation with people in this room, would be really great because there would be accountability in that transparency. I think it has to be meaningful. Just We know from the financial sector, for instance, that just pure disclosure has never worked. Notice and consent doesn't work. So I think there's a question in the algorithmic context, how do we want to translate that? Okay, fantastic. Yes, I was reminded of John Dewey's work of 1929, The Public and Its Problems, where he basically says a democracy is not so much uh, about voting, voting is important, but the important thing is when people decide that their representatives are not taking care of their interests, mm -hmm. And then they begin to form publics, so he talks about publics in the plural, with regard to that specific issue. And the transparency here would be necessary if you're talking about participatory democracy. <clears throat> I should be able to find the people that suffer from the same kind of categorization uh, or vulnerability due to this. So that's, that's an interesting challenge. I'm going to go to the next person because four minutes is really very short. Um, so, Mariana Rielli, um, first to you, the same question. So, what do you think, what kind of vulnerabilities are at stake? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just realized that what I had prepared will not be, I won't be able to cover everything in four minutes, so I'm just going to choose some things. So, um, first, answering the question. Um, I agree with Malavika. I think it's clearly uh, both. It's not just uh, reinforcing existing vulnerabilities, but there are also cases where you could imagine people who would per perhaps be perceived as privileged in the sense that they are not part of um, groups with um, protected, protected characteristics or that they would not necessarily be considered vulnerable. Uh, but that can be made vulnerable just by the relationship and the kinds of interactions um, between humans and AI. So this is just a very broad answer. I think it is both. And then the question is how does, kind of advancing a little bit into what we're going to discuss later, I think, uh, how can the legal frameworks um, deal with those two kinds of vulnerabilities? And uh, just looking briefly at the um, draft bill in Brazil, which is where I'm from, uh, for the regulation of AI, and also a little bit at the EU AI Act, I think even though it's not very systematized necessarily, those um, categories are not necessarily explicit. Uh, they are there. There's the concern with like the specific uh, protected uh, groups uh, that are mentioned, and then the question becomes like, how narrow um, can you be and what are the criteria for singling out certain groups? I think this is one of the discussions that was one of the criticisms about the EU AI Act um, initially and also something that happened in Brazil. But in the second case concerning like the more general uh, vulnerability that is, um, it, it is in a way a premise uh, of this relationship between uh, AI systems and the people that are affected by AI systems. Um, I also have a little bit of, I don't know, doubts regard regarding how to address that in the legislation because I think considering that as this would be a criteria for uh, defining risk doesn't make a lot of sense to me since uh, we are talking about something that is not um, it doesn't differentiate, it's just something that is apl applicable to everyone. So I don't think it's a criteria for risk. And in Brazil, uh, it's very interesting because this was something that was considered uh, in the, the, the explanatory memorandum of the current draft. Vulnerability is mentioned at the very beginning as um, one of the objectives of the proposed legislation, which is to ensure rights to the most vulnerable link in the relationship between um, AI and humans. So it's a very, it, it is considering that everyone is vulnerable, but then right after that, it also mentions that, well, in Brazil, the context in which this is taking place is marred by inequality and racism. And so there are specific definitions that have a very clear dialogue with uh, anti-discrimination legislation. 
And we in Brazil, I'm going to just wrap up briefly, but the way that we kind of have chosen to go is not for a risk-based approach. It's more of a rights-based approach with some uh, risk elements uh, so that there are specific new rights uh, that are applicable to every person that is affected by AI systems. And then, of course, you bring in the specifics of the uh, groups and the protected characteristics, both to ensure specific rights, but also to kind of um, inform the risk um, evaluation assessment. So it's kind of a mix. And I think that kind of makes sense when you combine the two kinds of vulnerabilities that exist. So <laughs> I think I spoke too much, but that would be Not at all. Thank you very much. Could you um, elaborate a little bit on how you see the relationship between fundamental rights and vulnerability? You already said something about it, but uh, I think for the audience it's also very interesting to hear what differences you see in terms of fundamental rights and vulnerability between, for instance, the EU and Brazil. Okay, yeah. Um, so I think well, the way I see it, fundamental rights are mentioned very extensively in the EU, uh, EU, EU AI Act as kind of the, the backdrop um, uh, against which harm is determined and risk is assessed. Uh, but it's not necessarily very focused on uh, new rights or rights that are derived from those fundamental rights. While in Brazil, you have uh, in the, this uh, proposal, you have... Um, the principles, and then you have um, a set of uh, specific rights uh, that can be, that are actionable and that can be um, brought um, um, by the administ administrative sorry administrative uh, authority, but also um, the judiciary. And there is a dialogue with um, both individual and collective fundamental rights, because um, we have constitutional case law in Brazil recent uh, related to data protection and how uh, data protection uh, as, um, a le as a part of the general data protection regulation, but also as a fundamental right, what is the interplay between those? So um, I think the, AI, the Brazilian AI Act is very strongly uh, rooted, not just in uh, fundamental rights as this like backdrop, but actually, um, deriving other rights and saying how those rights can be uh, exercised. Um, so I think that would be kind of a difference. <coughs> okay, that's very interesting because that's of course one of the criticisms that's often made of the AI Act that it does not attribute new rights, uh, actionable rights. Um, thank you very much. So I'm going to now give the floor to Fanny Kuder. 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 <laughs> how could I mistake that? Very <laughs> Belgium here, France. <laughs> so again, the question, what are the key vulnerabilities at stake, according to you? Um, so I'm going to, to talk a very, uh, about a very specific example. Um, as uh, as ADPS, we recently conducted an audit of uh, Frontex practices um, at the EU border, so uh, the specific situation of, of migrants. Uh, irregular migrants in that case, um, where actually uh, when they are disembarked, they are screened, fingerprinted, and some of them uh, are subject to debriefing interviews. And that's how uh, the collection of data is, is uh, that I, I would like to illustrate, re is reinforcing actually this, uh, the situation of vulnerability in which they are. Because what's, what's interesting, so debriefing interviews are uh, conducted in order to uh, gather um, intelligence about uh, migratory routes. Uh, trends about uh, smuggling network, that's the uh, primary purposes, but also to collect information about smugglers, so more uh, of a law enforcement uh, nature. Um, and they are based on uh, consent. They are tagged to be voluntary, and they say, well, uh, we pseudonymize, well, we anonymize the data because we don't collect the, the names, so these are what is in place. And so um, we wanted to know uh, more about that. Um, because what's happening is that it's a, a collection of, of uh, the all <laughs> about data about the whole life of this uh, migrant who is just um, in a very uh, yeah stressful uh, situation, just uh, risk his life crossing the the sea. Um, 
And, and, and still, we, we, we are relying on consent to gather all this information. He, he, he will uh, provide information about people who put him at risk as well. Um, so the, the, the task has been, and, and maybe that's what I want to illustrate, the task also is to identi first identify what is the harm uh, to the person fundamental right and what is, is, is this vulnerability because nobody will challenge that they're in a vulnerable uh, position but what is maybe more difficult is to uh, operationalize this concept and um, to, uh, to to identify which are the risks um, that this kind of collection uh, generate for, for this person because it's presented as something for them to help them so they, 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 they can talk about their journey and they can protect all the people while actually uh, what uh, our analysis were a bit uh, different because we, we, we really uh, think that this, uh, this kind of interviews um, imply risk for the, uh, the, the person being interviewed uh, because they may face reprisal from facilitators, smugglers, or, or they may lead, to in, to, to this may, may, uh, lead them to incriminate themselves during the interview. Um, this also uh, generates risk for the person who are being reported as suspect because this information afterwards is not verified and then it's put into the system, shared to, with Frontex and then uh, shared with Europol uh, and then shared back with the member states uh, yeah, uh, without uh, many more uh, safeguards. And it's also used to produce, uh, produce a risk analysis uh, in terms of uh, mega trade trends, so to be able to better target uh, uh, people, uh, but also to inform policy making. And uh, even looking at the future, we can uh, imagine that this information will be used, for instance, in the context of ETIAS to define the risk profile uh, of uh, people uh, posing a, a supposed threat to uh, security or to um, uh, or to irregular immigration, and, and there, there the, the impact is much broader than the interviewee or the irregular migrant because I mean it can affect all third country national traveling to to the EU because they will be put into certain um, uh, categories because of that. So the, the yeah, I wanted to illustrate this vulnerability, and uh, what we found was that uh, relying on consent uh, for that, and even being transparent, providing information to this uh, person was not sufficient uh, in order to uh, counterbalance the situation of vulnerability. Would you say that <coughs> the GDPR? and or the LED directive, what, what is the applicability here of the GDPR to people who are not yet in the EU officially? Well, the, it is applicable because it's uh, the data being collected by controllers who are based in the EU. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I would say that would be the link. And there is no exception, sorry for my total ignorance, no. it seems. Uh, no, no. Okay. no, so no. This and, is and the GDPR. charter applies to any individual, irrespective of this nationality. Yeah. But then isn't it a clear contradiction with Article 7 4, so and the, the imbalance, so consent seems to be just like an employee, an employer cannot ask consent from an employee. Yeah. Isn't this a much worse situation? It is, and yeah. that's why we, we, we found that okay. consent is not, uh, and there are all the safeguards huh, that we, we, we try to, to, um, to look at this from the principle of fairness. Uh, yes, yeah. so I would like yeah. to ask what is the role of fairness here from the perspective then yeah. of the GDPR and the potentially the AI Act? What could be the role? Um, yeah, so the role would be to, um, so, um, well, we, we, we consider that fairness uh, requires not only that there is a clear, clear understanding from the part of the individuals uh, whose data are being collected, uh, but also uh, it imposes an obligation on the controller not to in, uh, get involved in deception or misleading practices, no, not misleading individuals at the moment of data collection. Um, and also, um, we, 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 we consider that the assessment should be made of how this processing will affect the interest and fundamental right of those concerned as a group and individually. Uh, and and, sh and personal data should not be used in ways that could have unjustified adverse effect on them. 
And, and for that, uh, uh, we, we come to the conclusion that what would be necessary to put in, in place a, necessary of, uh, a series of structural safeguards, which may exist in other legislation uh, as a right of um, uh, people who are de in, in a detention situation to be protected to ask for legal aid. There are some structural safeguards to protect uh, the right to fair trial, the presumption of innocence, all this right that can be endangered by this kind of, of practices. So to look at the broader picture uh, and trying to uh, address uh, in order to restore the balance. Yeah. This seems uh, the exemplary situation where DPIA has been done. Has it been done? <laughs> No, no, uh, they relied on consent, what for? <laughs> <laughs> but that is never an argument for a DPIA, right? If you want to process yeah. data, you have to do a DPIA. Yeah. And if you ask for consent, <laughs> that's more reason no, and to And the do argument a DPIA. also was that, um, as a name uh, is not collected, these interviews were anonymous. So that's something also that we disagreed, let's say. <laughs> more reason for a DPIA. Yeah. So are you arguing in the report for a DPIA? Um, not, no, yet. not yet. No, we, we are going. Actually, we are one step further. We made the assessment. <laughs> we're making recommendation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so. Or you are going to do a DPIA for them? Okay. Thank you very much. I think this is a, a absolutely key, a very clear example of a um, vulnerability enhancement. Um, Jean Claudio. We are here because of you. <laughs> it's all your fault. No, thank you very much. I think this is an extremely important uh, panel. Uh, thank you for inviting us. Um, so what do you think are the key vulnerabilities here? Thank you so much, Mirej. And I'm super uh, excited to see a full room on this topic. I mean. I think a few years ago, we couldn't expect a full room on vulnerability. So I, I think the key word now is around. Uh, so I feel excited about that. Um, I think uh, so. Uh, what we saw so far um, reflects well the title of this panel, Vulnerable Who Cannot Be Defined If We Don't Understand Vulnerable When and Vulnerable To What. In other words, in my view, there's not such a thing as vulnerability per se. I mean, there's no one that is always vulnerable. You are vulnerable to something and in certain situations. Vulnerable when, uh, a short answer, in a position of power imbalance. And uh, uh, I hope uh, most of you were yesterday at the keynote of uh, Julie Cohen on power governance. And I think this is, this is very much uh, a topic of discussion that we should have in connection between different fields, like from data protection, competition, law, consumer protection, looking at the bigger picture. So vulnerable when, for in situation of power imbalances, vulnerable to what? To fundamental rights. So my question, my research question now is, what is the link between power and fundamental rights? Because uh, that, is the, that is maybe the, the, the suffering link. And I think that uh, conceptual help here can come maybe from competition law. Why? Because so fundamental rights. So a, a vulnerable person is a person in position of higher risk to their fundamental rights. Uh, how this is connected to position of power imbalance? Well, when there is a situation of an entity that has uh, the exclusivity, the monopoly for the satisfaction of my fundamental needs, or my capabilities, just to mention Martha Nussbaum, that is a power imbalance situation. So when someone, Google, for my uh, right to uh, look for uh, answers online, or ChatGPT, or Replica, for my interests to be in an um, uh, emotional relationship with uh, someone, or uh, Tinder or Grindr for uh, more physical relationships, or, you know, and even a child is not vulnerable per se. I mean, uh, this is, I mean, uh, then we will see what Simone, but a child in situations of um, like an adult that has the monopoly for the satisfaction of uh, uh, their fundamental needs that then become fundamental rights. So I think there is this uh, interesting triangle between power imbalance, 
uh, fundamental rights and fundamental needs. And this is very well, uh, I think we can summarize it through the word dependency. We are all dependent as human beings. This is, I mean, Martha Feynman, another Martha, another American Martha Feynman, the idea of connection, uh, vulnerability is based on dependencies, right? So I think this, uh, this point um, should be very clear when we when we mention this. Uh, a, a clear example, again, on, on social media, why, why is there, because we, you were asking for examples, right? And I think, for example, when we, um, uh, so we say, yes, there are vulnerable users of social media, yes? Uh, why, wh what is here, the power imbalance situation and what is the fundamental rights? Many, but just if we look at accessing to, the, to Facebook, to Meta, to Instagram, etc. We are in that situation, right? Our right to be, our, our um, uh, network effect, our form, our fear uh, of missing out can be satisfied just through the social media uh, platforms, right? Um, so I think we have to keep in mind, I mean, I think something we are seeing today, also with the discussion of ChatGPT, there was uh, uh, the ban in Italy, for example, or Replica, uh, also being banned in Italy again. <laughs> uh, uh, there was this, this point on expansion of fundamental rights. When we have new affordances, when we have new technologies, that become irreversibly part of our uh, capabilities. So going to, uh, and if these capabilities are uh, enabled by private platform, it means that it's not the state anymore that has to guarantee fundamental rights, but it's the pri private platform. So we should abandon the contract, uh, the contract uh, uh, um, a framework model where you have, you know, do no harm. Here is not do no harm, here fairness means being sure that all fundamental rights of my users are satisfied. But this is a real change in terms of law and uh, policy because it means that now Zuckerberg is the new, I, I don't know, um, Ursula von der Leyen, I don't know how to compare, but like, you know, because our fundamental rights depend on platforms, right? And so, uh, and here maybe health can come from digital constitutionists, but this is going very, very far, so I will stop here. <laughs> yes, because I, of course, have questions. Um, so when we look at the AI Act, at the, uh, especially at the, the, the parliamentary version that's going to be voted next month, do you think that the, the way the concept is entering the AI Act, both of vulnerable individuals and vulnerable groups, is adequate, is good, is good enough? Or do you have recommendations for parliament? You still have three weeks. Yeah, <laughs> yeah um, well, this is a very, very um, complex topic and discussion because like, if we look at the first proposal of the European Commission on the, uh, the, the AI Act, uh, vulnerable people, vulnerable uh, end users, we might say, were under a very, uh, it was like a mess because actually um, the prohibited AI systems mentioned that you shouldn't exploit vulnerabilities based on age and disability. Just that, full stop. Age, so children or elderly, and disability. And I asked to the uh, <coughs> person, uh, the AI responsible in DigiConnect, say, why just these two? She said, we need predictability, and age and disability are testified by, are, are witnessed, uh, you know, can be checked by documents, right? Um, now the parliament is going in a very different direction, exactly as Mireille was saying, and uh, I would say, um, so now there's a bigger approach uh, to vulnerability, and uh, also in the, in the commission proposal there was this uh, mentioning of imbalance, so they said that the commission can uh, a, a large list of vulnerable, um, sorry, a large list of high-risk AI system looking at also vulnerabilities of individuals based on adversely impacted people in vulnerable, um, in relation to the user of an AI system, in particular due to an imbalance of power, knowledge, economic or social circumstances or age. I don't know about the difference between power and the other ones because I think power is a bigger box where we put information, economic or social, but you know, the law must, must not be interpreted like extremely, <laughs> we, we can interpret the whole sentence and saying, yes, power imbalance is at the table, finally, first time, because even the DSA is not so clear on that. 
still there's much more to discover because the parliament proposal mentions also vulnerable individuals and or groups. And this is an open, an open point. Huh? I think we all have our own view if vulnerability is group-based, it is individual, if it's subgroups. So a lot, a lot, a lot to discuss. Um, but I think it's really in the good direction. If we see at the first proposal, this is much better. Also, there's not the limitation on age and disability anymore. They say any form of vulnerability, which I'm sure will be uh, a problematic in the trilogue because the council and the commission will want more predictability, of course. But uh, I think we as a civil society, academia, uh, whatever we feel, I think we should uh, fight for these uh, uh, prohibitions because there are many cases, we just saw at this table how many cases of vulnerability exploitation can happen. And prohibiting ex post is a problem because like the replica case I was mentioning, people might depend on something that exists. So prohibiting it might be too late. We should ex ante um, act. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so now we go to uh, Simone van Hof. And again, first the question what, uh, with a very surprising answer, I think, <laughs> what vulnerabilities would you pick out as salient and important? Yes, and you might think, I, I focus on children, for those who don't know. Uh, so you might think I have it easy because children are often seen as inherently vulnerable um, uh, because of their evolving capacities, which is a central concept to, uh, to children's rights law. And, um, and the evolving capacities uh, are about children growing up, uh, you know, developing their capabilities, uh, their capacities, so to say. Uh, and uh, becoming more and more autonomous uh, and, you know, enabled to make their own independent decisions. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, evolving capacities is actually an enabling, so it's not so much about vulnerability, it's an enabling principle, and uh, it requires that children get the proper guidance uh, and support while growing up to, you know, uh, to grow up in, um, in a healthy way. Um, and... Um, so this is mostly obviously done by parents and, and the people that surround children, but you could also make the link to, uh, to technology and say, okay, but uh, also the design of technologies can support children and guide them uh, given their evolving capacities. Uh, and this, is ac this actually ties in with this concept uh, of age-appropriate design that we see more and more. So to use your words, it's actually empowering through technologies, uh, children through technologies in line with their capabilities. Uh, so when I, so the source of children's rights is the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. When you look in the, in the convention, you won't find the word vulnerability or vulnerable. And for me, the entry point there actually, uh, when focusing on vulnerabilities of children is the best interest of the child principle. Uh, which is about um, uh, taking the best interest of children as a primary consideration with respect to any activity that impacts children. And this can obviously also be the technologies that are designed and that they, uh, that they then use. And what it means is that uh, what is in the best interest of the child is it means basically that you uh, mitigate any harm uh, that might occur for children, but also risk of harm. And it goes even further than that. It also requires that you focus on contributing to the well-being of children. So it's not just about mitigating harm, but also making sure that they're doing well when they're using these technologies. So the susceptibility to harm approach that Malavika already mentioned obviously is included in this and it and you know it includes all kinds of vulnerabilities so inherent to the person uh, there are very different children uh, that may have different vulnerabilities but there are also, also children in very different situations uh, my grandchildren are an example that come to mind but also children that have a very problematic home situation uh, they may also be particularly vulnerable to certain situations so this is all included in that approach approach, uh, but the susceptibility to harm approach is also too restrictive from a best interest principle, and this is because uh, of two things that I already mentioned. Uh, first, that uh, uh, tied in with the best interest principle is also the precautionary principle, which means that we already need to step in whether, whether, when there are any indi indications that a certain 
uh, activity, and in this case also the use of technologies, might lead to harm for children. So if there is risk of harm, risk of future harm, uh, we need to step in, we need to take a better safe than sorry approach. So we're, we're not going to wait for harm to happen. And the second reason is with, uh, ties in with what I said before, that um, it's not just about avoiding uh, compromising vulnerabilities, but it's also about contributing to the well-being of children. So when they use uh, digital technologies, uh, it, it should also contribute to their freedom rights, to their civil and political rights, like freedom of expression, freedom of information, uh, and, the free, and the freedom to play, so children have a right to play. So when I then focus on your question as to you know, the impact of technologies, what I see uh, is, and from a best interest perspective, is that actually uh, the vulnerabilities of children are, um, uh, are targeted and magnified uh, by a lot of the technologies that they use, also use in very positive ways, but also use in ways uh, that are not always in their best interest. And the reason for that is uh, mostly in many cases is um, that commercial interests actually trump the best interest of the child when we look at uh, how these technologies are being designed and, and therefore how they, uh, how they turn out to be used. Uh, and actually, you know, commercial interest trumping best interest is actually violating the best interest principle uh, and thereby also violating all kinds of rights that children have that are ingrained in that best interest principle. So to mention just a couple of examples that I think are not in the best interest of the child, and we all know them here in, in the room, are targeted advertising, uh, monetized matchmaking in games, uh, all kinds of aggressive, misleading commercial practices that we all also sometimes call dark patterns, but also being pushed in towards in-app purchases to win games, uh, um, uh, and also all kinds of algorithmic-driven uh, harmful content or content that children see that then turn into harmful content that they cannot avoid. Uh, avoid. So there's a lot of uh, examples, I think, where we see uh, that they are not in the best interest of the child and actually viol violating that best interest as one of their uh, fundamental rights. Do you think the current legislation or the upcoming legislation as it stands now um, takes enough of this precautionary approach that you spoke about or is it very much, okay, first show me harm and then we can go somewhere? We know this ex-CEO, Mr. Schmidt, who said we should not regulate things like large language models until you can show me some harm, right? So is there enough precaution in the legislation? Well, maybe first go to harm, because if you want to challenge some of those commercial practices that I just mentioned, uh, yeah, as a user, when you look at the law, you need to prove harm. Um, and uh, that is difficult uh, more generally because uh, we're looking at systems that are really complex. Uh, so for individuals to show that they are being harmed by those systems, it's, it's you know, almost impossible, uh, you could say. And then when we look specifically at children, uh, it's actually very difficult uh, with respect to them to measure what the harm for them is. It's, it's difficult to find evidence, to do uh, research uh, about children and to find that evidence. And uh, particularly also when you look at uh, more the long-term consequences that some of these systems may have on children. Uh, we, sometimes we just don't have the evidence yet. We, we only have indications that something is harmful. So uh, then turning you your, to your question about precaution, then I might, you know, indeed we need to have these precautionary measures in, in order to, uh, to have that better safe than sorry approach and not wait for the harm to happen. Um, and to a certain extent, we have it. Uh, it may not be enough, but to a certain extent, we have it. And to take the Digital Services Act as an example, for instance, uh, you need to do a fundamental rights impact assessment, or at least uh, the, the very light, large online platforms need to do a fundamental rights impact assessment, which ob obviously is also about children's rights. So children's rights are the fundamental rights of children. So they are included. Uh, but it's only about sy sy uh, systemic risks, because uh, we're looking at the blob, so it's about systemic risk. Uh, and when we look at these, these technologies that children use, there are a lot of other risks for them that are not systemic. Um, uh, that can even be individual, so uh, being sensitive to certain harmful content or even contacts. Uh, that children might encounter. And you need to, from a best interest perspective, you need to also focus on these risks. 
Um, and then these systemic risks are not limited to these very large online platforms. Uh, so I would say you need to, you know, you need to start to look at those kinds of risks right from the start when you start designing uh, these digital services that your children are going to use and not wait for these platforms to become large uh, because that's when you can still change something uh, and otherwise you will be too late. Okay. Um, I'm very curious. You said something about uh, children's rights being included in the framing of fundamental rights uh, in the Digital Services Act. Has this been uh, asserted by the court, I don't think so, by other courts, EDPB, uh, other regulators, because this is very interesting. I've always understood the reference to fundamental rights and freedoms as referring to the charter. And you are now arguing to say that should include the children's rights. Has there been case law about that? It, this is obviously an uh, argument that you are making. Yeah. But yeah. It's actually in the Charter. Article 24 of the Charter is about children's rights. And, yeah. um, and obviously the, the EU itself is not a, a party uh, to uh, the UN mm -hmm. Convention on the Rights of the Child, but yeah. the, all of the member states are. Actually, all of the countries in the world are except for the United States. So they need to factor in uh, children's rights whenever they're, you know, when, whenever they need to um, uh, make sure that uh, the, you know, uh, they comply or do an impact yeah. assessment on fundamental rights. It, for children, it means children's rights, yeah, and okay. to a cer to a certain extent, they coincide with the fundamental yeah. rights of, uh, of of you know of us adults. But they have other rights as well. And I mentioned already the right to play, uh, but another one that is important in this respect as well is the right to protection from economic exploitation. Yeah. So a lot of these commercial practices that I just mentioned uh, would actually violate that right of children and also violate the right of children to play because commercialization of play uh, is seen under that right as something very problematic uh, for children. Okay, well, I very much look forward to a case where this is challenged. So where so do says, I? Yes, yeah, so do yes, I. Good. <laughs> where the I, somebody going to court and saying that the commercialization of certain games are a violation of the right to play. Very yeah, when they are aggressive case. and misleading, and mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, yeah, so but, yeah, uh, there's always taking into account the evolving capacities of yeah. children. Yeah. yeah and power imbalances, etc. Okay, thank you very much. We have now all spoken, and that means that I would like to give the floor to you, because I assume that this has raised a lot of questions. So, yes, could you please go to the mic so that this session is, of course, recorded, that we include it in the recording. Oh, really? Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Mohamed Demirjan. I'm a senior legal consultant at Deloitte Belgium. Uh, my question is more for Django, for all of you actually, uh, and it relates to uh, yeah, the Parliament's update of the AI Act, uh, bringing a new obligation of fundamental rights impact assessment on deployers or users, whatever you want to call them, uh, and taking into the DPIA experience in practice, how are we, basically I, I, I accept that that's a good step forward, but how are we going to really uh, operationalize that? Is it uh, organizations, are they supposed to analyze every fundamental right relating to AI use? Or do you think there will ever be a negative outcome and a business will actually reject the AI use because it is, it didn't pass the fundamental rights impact assessment test? Uh, how does that also relate to vulnerability? What should vulnerability be involved in that assessment? Uh, general. So it's basically a general question in, uh, with regards to uh, operationalizing fundamental rights impact assessment in the AI Act. Okay, we have about 20 hours to discuss this <laughs> <laughs> because you know it's quiet here behind us now, quieter. Um, I, I would like to restrict the question to the vulnerability because your other question, is this ever going to be operationalizable, operationalizable, blah, blah. Um, difficult word, uh, is maybe a bit too big, but I would like to focus it on how could you operationalize a DPIA with regard to vulnerability. Um, anybody wants to step in? Uh, yeah, I think the yeah, operationalization is a, a very uh, 
big problem for fundamental rights enforcement because actually, I mean, I think that, that we miss the theoretical basis, how we quantify the impact on fundamental rights. We can quantify from civil law, we know how to quantify harm to property and to health. And they are, there are numbers for them. It's much more difficult to quantify impact on other things, like how you quantify impact on discrimination. And in the room we have people who did a wonderful impact assessment and that are studying impact assessment, but just to say that here the problem is the threshold and because then of course, bridging this to vulnerability. We need impact assessment because we need to understand what's the higher risk and, and who is in that category, right? And in that category, we can say they are vulnerable, but we need, we need some forms of metrics, right? It's, it's quite impossible, we know, but connecting this to the I Act, uh, the European Parliament compromise, in their Article 29A, where they propose this fundamental right impact assessment, they say, they take quite a principle-based approach. So they don't say this should be done step A, step B, step C. But they add, in my view, something that can really help. In particular, participation of individuals, participation of uh, uh, impacted and vulnerable groups. And also the GDPR has something like, oh, if you want, seek the view of data subjects. But nobody does because it's when possible. Here, I see it written better. They say you should give time to them to react, you should look at, and there is a list of groups that could help. And connecting this maybe to other European digital strategy, data cooperatives in the Digital Governance Act might help for that. And uh, we have also Data Governance Act people uh, nodding. So yeah, I think, I think this, is, this is something that we should look in connection. And uh, yeah, and of course, we need either uh, 20 hours to discuss this, so. Yes, yes. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm tempted to say I, I think what you're saying about the quantification is absolutely key here. So there is a very interesting concept called qualitative probability. So this is more about ranking different um, what we like to call risks, but risks already has this very quantitative ring to it. But you could say instead of saying this is a risk of 63 point two, four, six, eight uh, percent, which is of course absolutely nonsensical for a lot of evidence-based reasons, is to say, okay, this risk is medium, this is a high risk, this is a low risk, and to compare things. So the, here the risk is bigger than the other risk. And I think if you're talking about theoretical inquiry, it would be great if people start writing PhDs, <laughs> other kind of research into how do we go away from this quantification conundrum, but nevertheless recognizing that it is important to say something about the extent of an impact on fundamental rights. I think to say that a fundamental right, you can quantify the impact, is like a Trojan horse. It means that you introduce all sorts of assumptions that play in the agenda of people who will say, oh yeah, can you prove that? Do you have the data for that? Oh, that's what you feel? That's very subjective. We're not gonna listen to that. So this is not about giving into subjectivism, but into saying, look, we all agree that um, somebody's safety, so dying, for instance, uh, has an enormous impact. But the impact of a child not actually being able to, to play in a way that is not manipulated into certain behaviors that can cause for the whole rest of that child's life uh, certain insecurity, for instance. You could say, well, that doesn't rank similar to death, but it's, it ranks higher than. And I think to, that this also involves having the people who will suffer the consequences of these tools that we're talking about, involving them, listening to them, and developing methods of, for instance, participatory research. Not in the sense for what do you think, what do you think, okay, everybody thinks it's terrible. That's not scientific research, but to really go into the theory of this. Um, I would like to ask the same question to all the panelists, but maybe it's better because we have two people in line. We can always come back. If you have an urge to answer that question, okay. Um, next question. Uh, maybe, oh, yeah. sorry. Yes, please. Uh, maybe just to add, um, because there is something in the recital that um, 
uh, 58 that really um, brought my attention maybe to Bill, I want to just say, it's that they say they should, a uh, deployer should identify appropriate governance structures in that specific context of use, such as arrangement, and they give example, human oversight, complaint handling procedure, regis procedures. And, and I, I think it's very, it would be very interesting to link the risk to the uh, measure you put in place to reduce that risk. And then it forces you to maybe uh, move away from the quantification and focus more on, OK, what are you going to do about it? Uh, because we know we have a redress procedure. How this redress procedure can be efficient, uh, put in place? How can be, uh, if we're talking about children, how can it be? Uh, accessible for children, so maybe uh, to um, because to move from a, a more yeah the next step. Uh, I, I think that's it. absolutely key. Uh, thank you very much because otherwise we're always going to talk about money, right? So there is impact, there is harm. We can prove it. Okay, here you get the money, and and that's not going to solve the problem. Of course, we need preventative measures uh, and linking the impact to, or the expected impact to this kind of very concrete measures um, sort of deals better with that, I think. Thank you. Next question. Uh, Lex Zard from uh, Leiden University. It's uh, going to be a kind of conceptual question. Um, Malavika started uh, talking about two dimensions of vulnerability. Can, can I, can can I ask somebody to put the mic up? Uh, yeah, because everybody has to. <laughs> Bend over. Go. Oh, I think, I think this you. works better. <laughs> uh, so Malavika started uh, bringing forth two dimensions of vulnerability, personal in class and situational and environmental. And then Mariana mentioned, uh, again, the two dimensions, but the, the actual dimensions were different. So one was personal again, but another one was relational, um, not environmental or situational. And then Gian Claudio mentioned triangle of vulnerability, uh, in, in, and uh, particularly emphasize the power asymmetries. And I want to be clear, at least on the panel, what do you think? So are we talking about two dimensions or three dimensions, which is uh, personal, situational, and relational or, or, or different asymmetries? Um, and if so, are they all equal? Because John claudio had a particular emphasis on the, on the power, but uh, others did not. So just to get clear on this, I think it's useful for you know, quantification or even qu qualitative evaluation of vulnerability to uh, understand like what concept are we talking about. Yeah, thank you. Great, so who wants to? I feel like, uh, okay, I'm going to quickly give my two cents. Uh, I think Jean Claudio is definitely the expert on this particular term, legally speaking. But so I think from my perspective, I broadly put into the environment based a lot of these literatures, right? Clearly, the literatures are evolving in this space. Like, uh, you know, in a few years ago, I don't think this was even common in the legal community. And definitely in my other field, when we say vulnerability um, in information systems, it doesn't, this is not the discussion which happens, right? It's always in the context of a, like a cybersecurity vulnerability. So I think. The terms are amorphous. Having said that, I just want to bring up one thing. Um, I do think it's difficult to have a conversation around commensurability here, and I, I think it came up in the previous one as well. This idea that we can rank order relational versus environment-based or situational versus. I, I, I think fundamentally, when you look at a unit or a person, the way that that structures and their specific circumstance impacts on them is not always commensurable. So I can't say, you know, one part race, one part gender, plus one part disability equals, you know, one part disability, one part caste, and one part something else. I, I just think fundamentally these are qualitatively different. And while I understand the need to kind of quantify them, um, I think my own leaning so far, and I, I'm not as far along in the journey, is to, actually, I was thinking about work by uh, Joe Tomlinson, who is an administrative law scholar, who has been calling for digital administrative law to work alongside the development process. And I think that harks back to what Simone was saying earlier, that we need to think about this earlier, right? The idea that ex post you say this was a vulnerability which was manifested is what we're doing now, that's fine. But I think my interest is really to understand how can we get how can we get some of this normative thinking in at an earlier part of the development process, right? So how can we start thinking about purpose limitation when we're thinking about how editable a digital artifact is? Uh, and I think that's where you can you can kind of start ring fencing future effects without having to get into that trading off one kind of right for another right or one kind of harm. So I understand mine is not a very metrics based answer, but I think. My caution is against having a more commensurability type conversation. But yeah, 
I think maybe you want to yeah. No, thank you for the question. Um, to clarify, I agreed with Malavika regarding the fact that there are both uh, old and new vulnerabilities, but I didn't go too much into the conceptual uh, part because I was talking about how I see that those um, old and new vulnerabilities appear already in the different frameworks, legal frameworks, and they are not necessarily very systematic in that. So you have all kinds of, for example, in the Brazilian one, there are some things that you could say are more relational, contextual, but are treated as like group vulnerabilities. So basically, I think this is a non-answer because uh, I just uh, was more focusing on how the uh, frameworks are dealing with those uh, vulnerabilities, old and new. And they, I at least don't think they conceptualize that very uh, systematically. Um, and I don't necessarily have um, a new proposal for that, but <laughs> that was it. Okay. Um, uh, next question. Hi, I'm Neeti from Leiden University. I mean, some of the panelists already know me. Um, uh, my question is actually that, you know, we have heard from the panel, and like Flexus said, that it seems that the struggle that I've had is also something that the panel seems to be struggling with a little bit. How to define vulnerability in a way that sort of measures all its, you know, different dimensions. And so I want to put this across to the panelists to ask if you have, uh, you know, some sort of a conceptualization of vulnerability that you would agree should be reflected in legislation. Like we know all the different dimensions, but what would be the ideal way that you would want to address it if, say, in the AI Act, for example? Whoa. <laughs> Answers. But I think your question is, um, OK, we can have long discussions about all the different dimensions in situatedness, but we need a de definition with critical potential um, that can do the work for us, right? Yeah, yeah. so I think that's a, that's a very good question. Yeah, M maybe just to... Um so I, I wouldn't want to sort of uh, uh, have this really, uh, you know, have it as a definition uh, already. So what I like about the best interest principle, to get back to that, is that it's a very open principle, which is also an, a disadvantage because it may, might not be very clear, uh, but it's very open to interpretation. Uh, and as you know, it's also a principle of interpretation. So it's very helpful also when we find, you know, when we, when we find new concepts of vulnerabilities. So I think it's important to map what kind of vulnerabilities we need to look at. So also to, to get back to uh, the fact that we need to be, have a, more of a systematic mapping of what might be, what we might be looking at and how those vulnerabilities also interact with each other. Uh, because they may augment each other also, uh, so you need to have that um, uh, you, need, you need to have that overview, and, and that means also doing the research. Uh, but I, I'm not sure I would want to put it down in a very uh, specific definition because you would also be sort of restricted by that uh, uh, because we're still doing a lot of you know like you said uh, a couple of years ago we were not talking about vulnerability here so it's also very much an area that's that's you know uh, being in development and um, uh, and when we need to go to court with these laws uh, and it has a very strict definition uh, it won't be very helpful so uh, uh, so I think something that reflects these different uh, kinds of vulnerabilities uh, that we also now see in what you said before about what the AI Act says uh, is, is much more helpful, I think. Uh, and I think this also relates to something that um, uh, Mariana, that we communicated about, whether we need a universal definition, which is sort of valid for always, or whether we have to admit that that's maybe not a good idea and we should create a space where different vulnerabilities can be acknowledged and also acknowledge that they can interact with each other. So some people want to make, or some people, many people have been writing about how to define privacy. Their library is full <laughs> of that. And every year a new generation stands up and says, oh, for, for 50 years, all these academics didn't get over what it actually is, but I am going to solve this problem. Might be an engineer, but... Um, 
And I, so uh, my colleague Serge Goodwith, who is one of the people who founded this conference, wrote a book about that if you define a concept, then you limit the protection. That's exactly what Simone was saying. So there are some dangers in strict kind of definitions. If you want to go into this point, then I see your finger up. Is that correct? Can you stand for one minute there? Hi, uh, my name is Kava Nouri and I work at the European Disability Forum as AI Policy Officer. And I just wanted to fill in that um, it needs to be a fluent concept because first it can depend on disability but also in which situation. So for example, um, they did an experiment with self-driving cars and uh, it was not able to detect a person sitting in a wheelchair going backwards over an intersection and random over. And then when it was trained with more data, then it ran them over with greater confidence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it wasn't recognizing the person like properly. So uh, that's just an example. And you will not know uh, these defects in the uh, design unless you actually do extensive testing um, already in early in the process. So I would, I would advocate for more like a structured way of trying to find out which groups that might be affected and you will only know if you actually consult the groups because I've seen many examples of persons trying to imagine how different stakeholders would be affected and then they in, in some cases they even ended up designing a invention that actually wasn't helpful. Yeah so this sort of confirmed what people behind the table said that it's very important to involve the people that might be affected by these technologies to figure out. Yeah, and also acknowledge, I think, that this is a continuous process. Eh? So if we're going to do an impact assessment, it's not like, okay, we're doing an impact assessment and then we're done. <laughs> uh, but it's a continuous process because these technologies are also being further developed. Uh, then they are then going to be used. And that's also when this involvement of, of people becomes really relevant. Uh, but it's also use over time, so their you know uh, their users may change. They might find strategies to deal with their vulnerabilities that may be no new vulnerabilities. So we only see all this develop over time. So it's also a continuous process that we need to keep on engaging in, if we want to do it well. Okay. Yes, of course. Um, not to uh, continue this conversation more because I know we have another. A question, but very quickly, I wanted to flag two things from the uh, Indian policy process that are very tangible concepts that we used uh, in the context of data protection, but is valid here. One is the idea of obviously, I'm as, as I mentioned earlier, a bit skeptical about participative approaches in, uh, without a context, right? But I think one thing that we have found is using, say, participative research approaches where you use legal constru constructs like reasonable expectations and then consult with communities instead of saying, What do you think about self driving cars? saying, What would be your reasonable expectation of what? you know, the kind of flourishing you want to have or the kind of uh, capabilities you want to have, that is a more meaningful conversation. And I think that's already there's a rubric in the law around reasonable expectations that people might have in situations where there's a power imbalance. And I think the other concept that has been successfully kind of, it's in many drafts now of the law, but it's now uncontested in India is this idea of data fiduciary. And I think this builds on the best interest type of thinking where you reverse the burden. Now, half the problem is you have to prove you have a vulnerability, right? But if you, if you think of someone a data fiduciary being in a fiduciary relationship to act you know in the best interests of the data principle I think that also might shift that burden a bit and allow for some more creative thinking okay um, I just want to make one remark because for me intuitively saying susceptibility to harm that sounds like the universal definition but I'm immediately going to warn against it because the concept of harm comes from a utilitarian perspective on reality. It's a very Anglo-American uh, idea of how you deal with these sort of issues. And it involves immediately the identification of identifiable harm. So it has its lure. And I think in private law tort, this is what it's going to be. That's what private law is for. But when you're looking at impact on fundamental rights, that's more and it's different. And we really have to listen to the people who are experiencing it. Uh, two questions. Yeah. Okay. All right. um, Sorry. 
Wes Damon, a PhD candidate at the VU. I had a question that's kind of overlapping somewhat with people before me. That's, I guess, the risk of queuing a bit too late, uh, which is also, again, about the conceptualizing vulnerabilities and then translating it to actual legal criteria. And so I had two questions. One of them is, does the panel see any role for uh, proportionality in that sense as a criterion where you can say, OK, if we manage to conceptualize vulnerability in certain ways, that then infuses how a proportionality, uh, uh, let's say, argument should be made. And then you can say, OK, these are these types of vulnerabilities. Therefore, the violation is bigger and the safeguards aren't enough. And secondly, that's specifically for the UK situation, so Malavika Raghavan. Um, the Department of Work and Pensions is, uh, I would say, infamous for uh, scandal after scandal uh, and all the harms that have been done to citizens in their automation attempts of welfare, as have the Dutch. So not to, not to say they haven't. Uh, but the Tory government is actually for a while already playing with the idea of even leaving the European Convention on Human Rights. And so what legal options, or sort of anchors, do you see to address any of this? Because we have only five minutes, I'm going to take both the questions to make sure that they have both been asked and then give the floor to the panel for the final answers. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Krzysztof Garstka, Senior Research Analyst at uh, Trilateral. Uh, my question is about the methodology of engaging vulnerable uh, citizens, vulnerable people in the process of data protection impact assessment. Can you put the mic up? Because I think I will, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it's very difficult to hear what you're saying. Thank Much you. better, thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, do the panelists have any thoughts on what are the most recommendable methods of engaging vulnerable groups in the processes of data protection impact assessments and, um, and fundamental rights impact assessments? Any best practices? Any... I'm not talking about, again, the content, but the method of talking to them. Uh, I would be quite interested in hearing, uh, you know, whether doing this with children is in any way possible. So, thank you. Very interesting. So, we have two questions. What I will do is I will give a round to everybody and you can cherry pick which question you want to answer. Simone? Okay. Well, maybe on the final question. I'm not an expert on that, uh, to be honest, because uh, I, I'm a legal scholar and I'm not a... You know, I, I don't do research with children, uh, but I know that there are um, uh, groups that do participative uh, design with children, also working on interventions with children, and um, and and you can certainly do that. Uh, also, we have done some. You know, we do we do engage children sometimes in the research. So I, I developed a children's rights code in the Netherlands, and we involve children there as well. And what I find is that children um, have expectations about technologies, uh, they have concerns about technologies, they have very clear likes and dislikes about technologies, uh, and that's not just about how it looks, but also about the workings of technologies. They do say, like, okay, uh, they, they ask me a lot of personal data, I don't like it, but I don't have a choice, you know? So, um, and obviously you need to look at how you ask them questions, and, uh, and sometimes it's also, you know, sort of designing with them, uh, so to make it more creative. So, but there are, like I said, I'm not an expert on that, but I, I have seen groups do it in a very, very interesting way. And we can learn a lot from children in that respect. Okay. We have only two minutes, so I'm going to ask you all to be short, and I want you to have the last word for oh, obvious sorry. reasons. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, just so very briefly, I think uh, regarding both um, vulnerability and participation, I just want to say uh, at the organization I, I work for, we have a project with uh, pu public defenders offices in Brazil, which are the uh, public agencies that have the mandate of promoting access to justice for people that would be considered vulnerable, being made vulnerable, marginalized communities um, by any standards. And we've done research uh, about their concerns about data protection and privacy. And one thing that was very interesting methodologically was kind of um, not assuming that people don't care because they have all this other material you know, concerns and problems, and also approaching uh, them through the public defenders and also the ombudsman, uh, ombudsman offices who have those relationships established with those communities, and they can serve as kind of a bridge. So it was not like an um, impact assessment. It was more like a 
qualitative research into their interest, interests, interests, sorry. Uh, but I think it's, it's one way uh, to approach um, marginalized communities, uh, not necessarily vulnerable in any way. Uh, and also we are doing something about children too, and I can share that with you later. <laughs> Thank you. Since I'm getting a sign that we have to stop, but since people have been talking behind our back and not listening to us, asking them not to do that, <laughs> I'm going to fight back by inviting the panel to finish. Um, so maybe uh, quickly, uh, I, I'd like to maybe say a few words about proportionality. There is uh, some room for it, definitely. Wow. Uh, I would say, uh, just thinking about my example, when uh, applying fairness, this is kind of a proportionality as well exercise in the sense that uh, we, you have, we have the, the contract has to balance uh, in light of the risk and the, the, the measure put that it has to put in place to counter this risk is it still uh, worth <laughs> while, I would say. To go this way, or is it too harmful, or is it can it if it cannot be counterbalanced, then there's a, maybe a question: Is it so necessary that this justify this kind of harm? So to operationalize uh, proportionality in that way, I would say, it, yeah, that there would be uh, some role for, for it. Thank you very much. Um, I completely agree on proportionality, so thanks for saying that. <laughs> then I'll just quickly come on the DWP question. Um, I actually want to just point you to the work of my colleague, Alexandra Sinclair at the LSC. She's doing her PhD, and it literally it's on algorithmic kind of governance in the UK. I guess the big thing I will say here is that there's a big transparency problem. Uh, so there's a difficulty in understanding what are the criteria used in these algorithms and what are the weights. And the specific uh, section of the Freedom of Information Act under which you try and find out those weights allows law enforcement as an exception. So out of the eight criteria for sham marriage, I think is the example Alex uses, we only know three uh, of the criteria used in that sham marriage algorithm, and we don't know the weights. So I think before we can get into a substantive discussion, there's a freedom of information question around algorithms that we need to talk about. 20 seconds, so uh, about the, um, I liked the, the constructivist approach that arose from this table, but I still want to say that uh, a general provision on protecting vulnerability might have a sense, even in a broad definition like higher risk to fundamental rights, just to say that the state and uh, the fundamental rights enabler, like platforms, should act. And then the solutions can be special, but at least the general principle that law is equal for everyone, but sh we should have, there's a certain level of intolerability that upon which we should act. About the participation, there are many things, and uh, just uh, in the paper, not in practice, but uh, apart from the wonderful job that, uh, for example, was described by Data Privacy Brazil, but I think something also about vulnerable groups, I think we should consider at the table, uh, first there's a problem of how to finance them. We have to make sure that the groups are not paid by the data controller, because otherwise, of course, it's useless, right? And the state should pay for participation. Second, and I conclude, um, it, you cannot have just representative of their vulnerability, but also experts of their vulnerability. I think the two level, like children, you should have experts on children vulnerabilities and parents or, uh, you know, uh, teenagers, etc. And for everything, so to balance participation and expertise, because there is this problem of science populism that with COVID really became uh, an issue. Thank you very much to all. <laughs> Thank you very much also to the audience.